If you're interested in what I look like in real life and want to learn more about me, then follow my Instagram page at Joe the Insomniac. Hello everyone. My throat's doing a bit better in the minute, so hopefully my recordings sound better. Out of interest, what's the most scary urban legend you have native to where you are? I know you're from all over the world, so I'm interested in your native stories that you have to where you live. So I hope everyone's having a great day, and let's get to the stories. This happened six years ago. I was about 12. My brother was 26 at the time. My brother had been serving in the US Army for several years when this happened and was deploying to the Middle East on his second deployment if I remember correctly. Also of note was that he's a Green Beret and had recently completed the Army Special Forces qualification course. And by then, was an active duty SF engineer sergeant. Given that we'd both grown up with a passion for the outdoors, he thought it would be nice to take me on a backpacking trip in northern Alabama before he left for nine months. The trip had gone smoothly up until the third night we were camping out. Around 8 p.m., we had our camp set up, eating dinner, and were sitting by the fire talking about typical gun stuff, girls, etc. For reference, our spot was about 50 yards from a large stream, and about 50 yards downhill adjacent to the large path. Our camp, the stream, and the path formed a kind of triangle. This was summertime in Alabama, so it wasn't quite dark yet when two guys, who appeared to be in their late 20s, wandered up, asking if we'd seen any hogs while hiking. Given that this is rural Alabama, we had seen some further into the wilderness and told them so. Even though they were relatively polite, I got a seriously creepy vibe from them dirty clothes, greasy hair, bad facial hair etc. I think they probably looked as though they belonged in the movie Deliverance. They kind of hung out for a few minutes, maybe a little longer than they should have, looking around, asking us questions like, how long have we been out here? How long are we staying? And just kind of sizing us up. They then abruptly said goodbye and walk away. I didn't necessarily feel threatened by them. And I know for sure my brother didn't. But I still felt uneasy about the whole thing. Fast forward three or four hours. My brother and I had gone to sleep and were nestled in our tent when I was awoken by the sound of multiple dogs barking. I've always been a heavy sleeper, and they sound as though they're only a hundred yards away. My heart immediately starts pounding, and I kicked my brother through my sleeping bag, and asked if he was awake or heard the dogs. He responded, I'm awake. They've been getting closer for the past hour or so, so just lay still. Needless to say, I'm terrified. We would also hear sporadic shouts from several different sources, but neither came any closer. A few minutes later, my brother whispered, they're hunting for dogs. Don't worry, they're just hunting for hogs. They use the dogs to pin them down before they shoot them. This gave me some relief, but not too much. Somehow I managed to fall asleep again. The fact that they were doing this during night time was a huge red flag to me. 
Fast forward what was probably another 3 hours around 2am, I managed to sleep pretty well after hearing the first hog hunters when I woke up to my brother squeezing my hand firmly saying, wake up, put on your shoes and follow me, be quick. My heart immediately went back to racing because I heard the dogs and voices in the distance, further away than before but very distinct. Not asking any questions, I did what he said, and as soon as we're out of the tent, he says get back. We snuck about 50 yards into the woods, towards the junction of the path and the stream, crawl into the bushes. It was up a hill, so we had a pretty good elevated view of the campsite. I remembered as we laying there how loudly I was breathing and how quietly he was when I heard a very distinct sound of a pistol slide rack in. I look over to my brother and his hand pistol and he was watching the campsite and surrounding area. I begin whispering to him and he puts his hand over my mouth and points at the campsite. The group of hunters have been steadily approaching our campsite by this time, and have now reached it. This is over the course of 30 minutes. There were five of them, and like three or four dogs, they all looked crazy, and are relatively young with either rifles or shotguns. For those of you who are backpackers and campers, you know, nobody comes up on a random camp in the middle of the night with dogs and guns that has good intentions. I knew this, and so does my brother. I was freaking out, and so was my brother. Now they lingered for maybe 20 minutes, shining flashlights around, talking to themselves when my brother put his mouth to my ear and said, if they come towards us, I want you to run as quickly as you can. Don't stop. Don't look back. Stay off the trail and look for flashing lights. I knew I could make it back because he had taught me the land nav pretty well. He then handed me a flashlight and told me not to take the red filter off. He told me later that the red filter helps preserve night vision, cutting down ambient light so it's harder for someone to see you from a distance. By now, I was so scared I started crying, but at the same time, I had a rush of adrenaline and what I think now was confidence that he thought I could handle myself. We lay there for a while longer, when out of nowhere they start screaming, where are you all at? Firing at random in the woods. My brother dragged me back behind the crest of the hill, throwing himself on top of me. Thankfully our position on top of the hill is protected from any gunfire. They shot maybe six or seven times then started walking in the direction they come from. They got maybe a hundred yards away when I heard a blaring siren, seeing emergency lights flashing through the woods. Turns out, my brother called the forest services on a satellite phone, and my family had it for emergency services, and had actually sent out to the forest services and game wardens to our area at the wilderness. The wilderness is about 25,000 acres across, so it took them a while to get there on the dirt roads. When we saw the game warden truck, my brother signalled them with the light and pointed them in the direction that the hunters had gone, and the other guy had sped off through the woods. As soon as they were all gone, we went back to our camp packed off our staff and waited by the path for the game warden to come back, who then gave us a ride in his truck. 
On the drive back, my brother told me how brave I'd been and that we couldn't talk about it to our parents the next day if I wanted to. I asked him not to do that because I know they'd never let us go camping again. When I was about 18, me and some friends took a trip about 7 hours or so down to the Appalachian National Forest near Tallahassee, Florida. We were going to do a little car camping, drink a few ice cold natty lights. As such, we didn't want to get bothered by any park rangers, so we drive way deeper into the woods. We get there, set up camp, had said natty lights, and me and a guy decide to do some exploring. So we walk about a hundred yards from our campsite to the main road. We see another path directly across from us and start walking. Immediately, we started seeing signs that someone had lived there for a while. Big bags of trash, stuff like that. Shouldn't have been a huge red flag to turn around, but, you know, we're young, nothing can hurt us. So eventually we get to the campsite of an old white guy living out of his van. Coven lines strung up, callers placed around it, and a big gorgeous dog. I think it's maybe a golden retriever. We tried to back out, but he sees us and begins talking. He's friendly enough, asking where we're from, tells us some cool spots to check out in the park. We end up chatting to him for about 10 minutes and go on our way. I kept thinking to myself how odd it was that he gave directions in steps. Not in yards or miles. The guy always seemed off balance too. Not drunk. Like he's on a balancing beam or something swaying a lot. And he was super excited to talk about national parks and forests where we're from. Okay, camping part over, we go back to our tents. Now fast forward two months, somebody calls me last night and tells me to turn the TV on. I oblige. I then see an old dude in a van. You see where I'm heading with this? I get annoyed at my friend and say, why'd you wake me up for this? He says, no watch. And I see the golden retriever and it all clicks. What the hell? The guy's name is Gary Mitchell Hilton. Convicted of at least four murders. He kidnaps and murders a girl on Blood MTGA. An older couple and a girl in the Appalachian. Not far away from where we saw him. Obviously we call the cops and they put us in touch with the FBI and we get flown down to take investigators to the campsite. We point out every spot we saw in it thinking, tell them exactly what happened, show them the places he describes to us. Now I didn't think anything would come out until after the trial, but apparently they found what appeared to be partially destroyed human finger bones in and around the campsite. My family used to camp in Alquin Park in Ontario when I was a kid. We used to do a lot of day hikes with our dog. Now the dog was a crazy runner and would run up and down the trail, back and forth between my parents, brother and I. This one trail ended at a lookout. My brother and I stepped to try and take in the view. My dog arrived a minute later traveling at full speed. He attempted to apply the brakes, but the momentum carries him over the edge. We freak out thinking that our dog's gone off a cliff with maybe a 70 foot drop. I ventured over to the edge to look and my dog somehow landed on a ledge which is only 10 feet down. 
Now what? Any movement and my dog's gonna fall the rest of the way down. It's a sheer face drop with no way to get there. And out of the blue appears a hiker with full climbing gear. Now this area is not known for a lot of climbing I and mean, I've never seen anything like it before. The guy goes down, rescues the dog. Now he's right next to us and we go to look at our dog, turn back to say thank you and he's literally vanished. He doesn't even say a word to us. This happened to me some time ago, back when I was 10, on a school field trip to a group of cabins some 70 kilometers or so away from the city I lived in. The point of the trip was basically to have fun. We weren't being taught much other than how to make shelters and light a fire in rain. For the most part, we're supposed to spend the majority of the time just falling around, playing tag and swimming in the nearby lake, and maybe playing board games inside the cabins when it's pouring. Things turned out to be less than fun. At first it seemed to be a great trip. We got to choose our roommates, and my group of friends and I obviously chose one together. So there's four of us, myself, an Indian guy, Canadian and Chinese. Neither of us had ever been on a trip like this before. So far from home in the middle of the mountainous terrain. When we got there, we took a tour which was led by the camp's coordinator. This 20 something year old with blonde shoulder length hair. He shows us the cabins the lake, the trowels, and the kitchen slash lunchrooms, and then stressed to us that it's so important not to wander far from the cabin since, being in a forest at the base of a mountain, the chances of getting lost are relatively higher. So we finished the tour, ate dinner, and then were guided to bed. As we had arrived somewhat late, my friends and I are extremely excited, with this being our first time sleeping away from home and everything. The Canadian friend had the seemingly brilliant idea to share ghost stories while we got ready for bed. We each come up with a fictional character that will creep out kids or murder people or something. I came up with this idea of someone called Psycho who would hide behind the shower curtains and then stab you when you stepped inside. Another guy come up with the typical monster under the bed that grabs you, dragging you under the bed. As the hour passed, the lights out drew closer. We started to get the creeps. By the time lights out hit, the next two hours were so high strung with a combination of excitement and nerves that everyone, excluding me, decided to share one bed, even though there's two of them. The guy's story about being dragged under the bed unnerved us to the point that we jumped onto the beds from nearby pieces of furniture rather than walk near the bottoms. As I previously mentioned, I decided to sleep on my own because three people in one bed was awkward and it's hot. We talked for a bit before turning off the lights and falling asleep, but I was awoken some hours later by what sounds like whispering. I didn't move at first since the stories we had shared while getting ready for bed were still on my mind. Then I recognised the voices, and realised my friends were the ones whispering from over the other side of the room in their bed. So I relaxed for a moment, and was about to call out and ask what they were doing when someone hissed to me, what is it doing? 
Immediately I thought of some monster looming over my bed. I freeze, eyes darting around in the darkness. I didn't see anything, as the room was empty, and it's just too dark to be able to really see anything. I'm now starting to panic a little bit. Someone else speaks. It was looking at him, said the Chinese guy, then adding, do you think it'll break the window? And then I look at the window. It was one of those floor to ceiling ones with the latch that opens up to the balcony. Standing up to the balcony, pressed against the glass was a silhouette of a person. The curtains were drawn, but they were white and thin, and we could see the wrapped shadow of a person, illuminated from the dim moonlight. The man was holding a long pole with a wide end, similar to a sledgehammer or axe. Guys? I whispered. The man outside didn't move, but the Chinese guy did. I don't even know how he worked up the courage to do this, but he crawled out of bed and slowly worked his way to the side of the window, ducked down low, all commando style. He reaches forward, grabbing the curtains and was about to peek between the fabric when the man outside knocks on the glass. The poor Chinese guy jumps up so badly that he pulled on the curtain, causing the entire thing to rip off the railing, letting us see the person outside. He was dressed in black, aside from a pair of orange shorts, having a ski mask on. What he held in his hands was actually a shovel, rather than a hammer or axe. Nevertheless, the four of us were terrified. The Chinese guy screamed and bolted for the door in less than a second. The four of us were scrambling out of bed and hightailing it for the exit, screaming all the while. The Indian guy tripped along the way. The Chinese guy is in such a rush that he slams into the door, causing the lock to nearly snap. In seconds, we're in the cabin's lobby. Everyone's rushing out of their room trying to say what happened. A teacher goes out to try and investigate, but found nothing. The person's disappeared. After that, it took an hour before we were convinced enough that we could even step back in our room. I clamber into bed with my friends, despite their protest, and we stay awake for the remainder of the four hours or so, hands clutching our flashlights and the curtains open. The next day passes normally, and we thought that we talked about the event, and that everything would be forgotten about soon. We eat lunch eat dinner, and then with a small sense of dread walk back to the cabins ready for night time. The same guy came back, but to a different cabin this time. When we wake up, and we get herded into the breakfast hall, and there's a group of girls talking about the man with the shovel, we soon realised that I'd seen the same person. Now nothing else happened after this. At the time we were freaked out, looking back on it now, I know that that guy was really messed up, whoever it was, and I'm glad that nothing further come of it, and that they couldn't actually get inside to us. Now I'm not a camper, or a ranger, but an archaeologist. A few years back, we're doing a massive survey in the middle of nowhere, in the interior of BC. All the crew had gone home. It's just my boss and myself left for a few days to follow up and confirm some coordinates and finish off some mapping. We head out from our motel an hour or so into the bush. Middle of nowhere along deactivated logging roads. The closest town is miles and miles away. 
we hike out to this one area we had found a couple of weeks previously. For some reason, the whole area felt off. So we get down to business and about 15 minutes after being hunched over mapping, there's a really weird deafening womp sound. I can feel the pressure in my ears change. I immediately look at my boss 20 feet away and he's white as a ghost staring back at me. It happens again. I feel the pressure in my chest now. There's chills all over my body. Every hair is standing on end. My boss just turns and looks at me and says, let's go. We grab all our stuff and speed hike back to the truck. We never discussed it since. I have no clue what it was, but I've never been so freaked out in my life. Even 10 years later, it still terrifies me to this day.